Hello, everybody. So hello and welcome to our wonderful talk that we're going to have tonight. Uh, my name is Professor John Kennedy, and I am the director for the Center for East Asian Studies at the University of Kansas. Um, I'm also a professor of political science. Uh, the Center for East Asian Studies at KU is a national resource center, or Title VI, and we basically help and work and integrate East Asian studies into our campus, into our curriculum, and also providing incredibly wonderful um, uh, talks and events, including the one we have tonight. Tonight is a very special guest, um, Professor Zhang Li. Professor Zhang Li received her BA at Peking University, or Beida, um, in 1990, and then she came to the United States to get her MA degree in social relations at UC Irvine, in 1993, and then received her PhD in anthropology in 1998. She has written three books. Tonight, she's gonna to talk about her third book. The first book, Strangers in the City, is uh, reconfigurations of space, power, and social networks with, uh, within the floating population in China, Stanford University Press. This is a remarkable book, talking about incredibly important issues of people's movement, the household registration system, and modern development in China, particularly that merging between rural and urban when it comes to migrants. This is a winner of the 2002 Robert Park Award awarded by the American Sociological Association. Her second book is In Search of Paradise, Middle Class Living in Chinese Metropolis in 2010 by Cornell University. This is also another remarkable book based on her urban anthropology and studies on middle class that goes beyond what we've seen in political science and sociology. And as a matter of fact, this also won um, the Francis Shu Book Prize awarded by the American Anthropolog Anthropological Association. And again, a winner of the American Sociological Association Book Award in 2012. Um, she won a 2005 UC Davis Chancellor's Fellow and a Guggenheim Fellow in 2008. Now, Beyond all these accolades, I know Zhang Li from 1995 as an undergraduate. Um, and she was at Beida, Peking University, doing her field work for her seminal book on strangers in the city, um, her dissertation and that book. And she was conducting this field work on migrant villages called Zhejiangsun, where close to 100,000 migrants were living in this compounds, I think around over 40 different compounds, and the government was just about to demolish the compounds. It was an incredibly important uh, field work that was going on at the time, and she was one of the few scholars studying the situation. As a matter of fact, Zhang Li is one of the leading scholars in urban anthropology, providing in-depth analysis and professionalism, but more importantly, compassion. She provides the insights and analysis but also the personal stories of people living in China and how they're going through these challenging times. So we are extremely lucky to have this incredible scholar who provide remarkable insights into China that we rarely see both in academic or journalism. So please um, let me welcome Professor Zhang Li. And today she's going to talk about Anxious China, her third book, Inner Revolution and Politics of Psychotherapy. Please welcome Professor John Lee. Thank you so much, John, for your very generous introduction. And thank you also for inviting me. And also, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, it's not ideal that we have to meet on Zoom under the circumstance, but I hope we'll still have a very good and productive discussion after the talk. So my talk today is intended to give an overview of my newly published book, uh, Anxious China in the Revolution and the Politics of Psychotherapy by UC Press. So now let me do a screen sharing so we can see some images here. Uh, actually, I need, uh, I need, oh, okay, I got it now, good, wonderful. So I assume you guys can, can see the slides now. Great. So I intended to give an overview of the book 
And here is a, a shot of the book cover, Anxious China. And I just want to note that I'm so happy and proud to have this uh, uh, artwork image as the cover of my book. Uh, this image is done by Hong Zhang, Zhang Chun Hong, who happens to be Zhang's wife, and she is an incredible artist and a good friend. So uh, I was very, very happy and honored to be able to use this uh, uh, image for my book cover because I think it really captures the mood of anxiety I try to convey in this book. So at the same time, after the overview, I also hope to uh, take a closer look at one of the specific issues uh, in this book. Um, so I, I want to give you guys a sense of how uh, me as an anthropologist, right, uh, approach this complex psychotherapy issues through ethnographic fieldwork. So I know Zoom talk can be very exhausting. So I'm going to try to keep my talk relatively short and leave plenty of time for discussion and questions. So China's economic reform has brought about profound ruptures in not only social economic structures, but also in people's inner landscape. The National Center for Mental Health estimated that over 100 million Chinese suffer from different kinds of mental illness. Faced with relentless market-driven competition, rapid social change, and the pressure to become successful, Chenggong, many Chinese people are suffering uh, mental disorder. Uh, they feel very unsettled and distressed. Some are turning to psychological counseling to grapple with their anguish and problems in hope to find a quick fix. So in this context, a new therapeutic language of self, uh, self-care and self-mastery, along with a medicalized language of managing anxiety, depression, and stress, yali is entering Chinese society. So this is a relatively new phenomenon. As a reporter once put it, quote, this is a radical shift in a nation where focus on the individual was discouraged, uh, largely discouraged by both socialist ideology and traditional culture, unquote. So my uh, book is an ethnographic account of a new inner revolution uh, unfolding in urban China. I mostly talk about the cities, not so much in the countryside. Uh, as my research shows, this bottom-up popular psychological movement is reconfiguring the self, family dynamics, social relationships, and the modes of governing. So I call this phenomena the inner revolution, to highlight its transformative impact on so many aspects of Chinese people's life. So even though this uh, revolution is still in its early stage, right? And that unlike before we know the cultural revolution or consumer, consumer revolution, uh, this revolution is re relatively quiet, but it engenders profound changes from within. Today, it's spreading rapidly in China and its impact goes far beyond the individual realm and uh, clinical space. So in the midst of this thriving therapeutic culture, a host of work units, for example, schools, enterprises, the police and the military are all increasingly keen to incorporate psychological techniques into their personnel management because these organizations uh, are also facing multiple challenges. Uh, I discuss them in the book. Therefore, psychological counseling is not limited to the reshaping of the individual and the family sphere, but uh, rather it also extends to governmental practices and broader social domains. So that's the point I want to 
uh, get across in this book is it goes beyond individual and the family. It goes into broad social and political domains. In the revolution, I want to demonstrate is simultaneously personal and political, intimate and social, subtle yet powerful. So in the book, my ethnographic gaze travels from clinical space to broader social spaces such as the family, school, and workplaces. So now let me say a few words about the context for my research. Since the early 1990s, a Sai fever, Xin Li Re, has been sweeping Chinese cities. It includes a broad range of things, for example, uh, the teaching and the learning of psychology, group and individual counseling, self-help and the cultivating happiness workshops and other mental health concerns. Uh, numerous books and magazines have been published on mental health and psychotherapy. So this is a picture of a, a popular uh, psych magazine it's called the Psychologist Xin Li in China. And as you can see, this magazine is largely catered to urban, younger, professional women, Chinese women. There is also a burgeoning regime of private counseling centers, training workshops, and websites on psychological well-being. So this is a uh, psychotherapy training centers for those who have got the state license but want to have more advanced training. I spend a lot of time there. Every summer I go back to China. I basically hang out with the people there. These are the young interns uh, who just got their license, who passed the state examination system for uh, being a therapist and they come here to get the advanced training. The center, uh, this man is the mentor, the one uh, who is a more experienced psychotherapist. International experts are also invited to lecture to large crowds of Chinese who are eager to learn how to escape emotional pain and attain the good life. And of course, among them, there are many, many uh, mothers, uh, urban mothers. This is a picture of a Harvard psychology lecturer, Tao Benshara, who is very, very popular at Harvard for giving a class on the science of happiness and positive psychology. And he has been invited to lecture in China. Um, his book called Happier, Sing for the Fangfa has been translated into China and it was one of the top sellers in Chinese bookstores. And by the way, when he went to China to give um, talk, usually it's in a big movie theater, uh, it would attract over a thousand people. So why the majority of such efforts are directed at middle-class urban nights? Some marginalized social groups like laid off workers and migrants are also subject to therapeutic intervention initiated by the government. So I don't really focus on that group, but a colleague of mine, Jie Yang, uh, wrote a book on those group, on those people. So this therapeutic term forms a stark contrast to the time under Maoist regime when psychology and psychotherapy and psychiatry were largely non-existent and considered useless, harmful bourgeois intervention. So I have a chapter in my book uh, tracing this early development of uh, uh, psychology in China. Right. So if, for those of you who are interested in history. So how do we explain the significant shift in the way people manage their well-being, endure distress and recast self when family bonds and social ties become increasingly fragile today? How can it be that a popular Thai fever has taken hold in China at this particular historical moment? So in my book, I explore the causes, logics, and ramifications of this expanding therapeutic culture. Uh, my book is titled Anxious China because I argue that among various uh, forms of mood disorders, anxiety, jiao lu, 
broadly construed in both medical and social terms, has become a key indicator for the pulse of contemporary Chinese society. So over the past two decades, it has become uh, it has come to my attention that Chinese people of diverse social strata are experiencing not only medically defined anxiety, but also widespread social anxiety for a variety of reasons. So uh, in the book, I discuss those uh, factors that drove people to this kind of anxious mood. Uh, this sense of the edginess is particularly palpable in China today because this society has been undergoing four decades of profound social and economic and cultural transformations. So it is in this particular uh, social milieu that I examine how this new psychotherapeutic culture takes place and thrive across a broad range of uh, uh, social domains in China. So before I turn to my book, uh, let me also tell you a little bit about my field work and the personal experience that inspired me to write this book. From 2010 to 2018, I conducted extensive ethnographic field work in the city of Kunming, the capital of Yunnan province. Um, Kunming happens to be my hometown and it's, it has evolved over the past three decades from a relatively poor, smaller city in a border area uh, into a regional hub of tourism, commerce, and international trade. Some of you may have been to Kunming. And it's also, you know, I, I mentioned my hometown where I grew up and I did extensive field work for my second book on housing and the middle-class communities. So during my field work, I was able to sit in a dozen of private counseling sessions, either individual or family sessions, and participated in numerous uh, psychotherapy training workshops as the one uh, slide I just showed you earlier. I also followed the several key therapists for many years who eventually uh, became very good friends. If you have a chance to read my book, you also see that this is a deeply personal project for me. Um, I have tried to incorporate some of my own encounter with anxiety attacks a few years ago after the passing of my mother. And also I try to incorporate some of my own family history, particularly uh, my late mother's long-term struggle with mood disorder, uh, who did not have the language to describe her anguish for years and years. And I also try to incorporate uh, some of my uh, friends' experiences in China. So these lived experiences really opened up a rare opportunity for me to connect with the informants and understand their emotional pain in a much deeper and intimate way. So I uh, be happy to talk about this uh, later on in the Q&A. So now let me outline the three central theme my book address and followed by a brief ethnographic example. So uh, the central theme here, three of them. Uh, the first one concerns the crucial role of culture in therapeutic encounter. So psychotherapy took hold and expand in China so quickly, largely because it's regarded as a potential answer to the myriad social and personal problems that need to be addressed in China today. Now, a key step to make imported psychotherapy work in China is through ben tu hua. This is a process, ben tu hua, namely Sai practitioners uh, must strive to make a globally circulated psychotherapy comprehensible for their Chinese clients and suitable for the local social condition and cultural sensibilities. So I call this whole process ben tu hua. You can translate roughly as localization or indigenization, um, but I think it's a more complicated than that. So uh, ben tu hua 
is not just an intellectual exercise, but a part and a parcel of a broad effort to tackle a host of difficult issues facing Chinese individuals, families, and organizations. And it's also not a simple translation process, uh, but I argue this is a very complex dialogic process during which Chinese practitioners must select, rework, and make sense of different strengths of therapeutic practices. So in the book, I discuss in great detail why among many branches of psychotherapy, Chinese therapists, at least those in Kunming, selectively embrace and rework three of them. So here, um, the three most popular psychotherapy branches uh, I found in Kunming, and it's largely true in China. So the first one is the Satya family mo uh, therapy model and its relationship with the Chinese family. Second is cognitive behavior therapy, CBT, and its relationship uh, with thought work, And the third one is sand play therapy and how that's articulated with Jungian theory and traditional Chinese culture. So now let me just give a, a quick uh, example for each of them, hopefully. For example, the core of uh, the popular Satya family therapy is to situate what appears to be the individual's problems into the larger family system, rather than isolating the troubles and problems of the individual to that one single person. So this is Virginia Satya who invented, the, invented this therapeutic model. She was very popular in the US in the 1960s and 70s, but now it's kind of out of, uh, out of fashion. So here people don't know her that much, but she is gaining a lot of popularity in China and being refashioned into a major figure in psychotherapy uh, for the Chinese. So the main gist of the family therapy here, uh, as I just said, focusing on the family dynamic rather than the individual, makes sense to many Chinese counseling clients. The therapies I spoke to suggest that the strong preference for family-oriented therapy is of course shaped by a long-standing Chinese cultural expectation of the self as a social self, and also one's obligation to his or her family and the collective oriented ethics. So there is this uh, intrinsic uh, connection there with the Chinese uh, social and the cultural expectations. My study shows that while, uh, however, Satya family therapy resonates very well with most Chinese people's thinking about the role of family in shaping an individual. In practice, however, it's not always easy to secure family participation in the therapy due to time pressure, financial limits, gendered understanding of parental responsibility and emotional care. So in the book, I discuss in much greater details of all these factors that shape this uh, therapeutic practice. Well, this is a couple of uh, Satya's book being translated into Chinese. There are many more. Now for the second, cognitive behavior therapy. Um, another example of a bentu hua is the connection between CBT, I call the CBT, and the uh, socialist practice of thought work, zuo. So let me go back to CBT. The gist of CBT is to use psychosocial intervention to help clients develop better coping strategies by modifying their dysfunctional thinking and the behavioral patterns. So uh, essentially it believes that you can change a person's mood and the behavior by changing how they view the world and themselves, right? Although the content and the aim of thought work differ greatly from those of CBT, treatment, 
one can identify some interesting parallels between the two. So in fact, three of the key therapists that I interviewed brought this connection to my attention because all of the three had been in the profession of doing thought work at the universities or state enterprises before they became psychotherapists. So there is this interesting connection. They found CBT a good fit with the way Chinese people think about the relationships between thought and behavioral change. So even though uh, now as a therapist, their focus for CBT, right, is not on political ideology anymore, uh, but rather on promoting personal growth and tackling emotional problems and the family troubles. They claim that the communication skills they had learned from the previous thought work can be applied to talk therapy, especially CBT type of therapy. So this is really interesting. So I would say the forms are similar, but the content uh, is very different here. Okay. Actually due to time, I would not go into too much here about the scent place therapy. It requires a lot more time. Uh, I'm gonna move on to talk about the, the second theme of the book that is therapeutic governing. Right? Some researchers have argued that modern welfare state tend to normalize the marginalized social groups by subject, uh, sub, subjecting them to the help of health experts and social workers. The basic assumption is that these marginalized people cannot govern their own life and they don't know how to adjust to the demand of increasingly stressful everyday life and thus they need expert help. For example, psychiatrist Thomas Zass depicted an even more dystopic image of the therapeutic state encroaching deeply into civic life, including the health and the soul of the people. So I instead want to adopt a more nuanced approach here uh, by using this notion of a therapeutic governing, because this notion reveals how psychiatric and psychological interventions are used by both state and non-state authorities to shape, regulate, and manage the conduct of individuals and social groups in much subtle ways. Uh, in, in such subtle ways that a lot of citizens are willing to embrace. So let me give you an example here. Uh, under recent political regimes, uh, a preferred style of governing is through the notion of guang ai, loving care, right? So rather than rule through domination, political domination or political control, uh, it's through a more subtle way, loving care. Now, one of the ways in which kindly care, loving care, uh, kindly governance is practiced is by integrating psychological care and education into personnel management for many organizations including the military, the police, and SOE, state-owned enterprises. Uh, here is a picture of the uh, police training camp by using cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is a group of uh, employees from uh, Yunnan's, one of the largest tobacco companies, it's a SOE and they are practicing this called body sculpturing uh, by the Satya uh, family therapy model. So you usually get up, you don't just sit there talk, you get up, you act to certain positions and you talk and it's a group activity. Uh, so led by the psychotherapist. Uh, in the book, I also give an example of a paramilitary hospital in Kunming that used the psychological testing uh, to screen new soldiers and establish the so-called psychological records for future use in case of promotion and so on. So soldiers are uh, also offered the counseling and training, uh, especially using positive psychology to enhance their psychological resilience so that they can handle stress better and they can handle disaster 
relief work better. So the incorporation of therapeutic techniques into organizational life in the name of care is transforming how governing is carried out in China and how citizens are reshaped and managed from inside out. And these are really new practice. You know, 20 years ago, it was unimaginable, right? But the reality is often more complicated because a lot of times therapists, especially in the military and the police are also party members. So they have to negotiate their dual loyalty to the party, to the leader above and fulfill their um, duty as a, therapists to protect their clients' privacy. Uh, so as you can imagine, this is not very easy. It's a, a lot of tension there. How do you balance uh, your dual identity there? Again, this is another shot, a positive psychology workshop for a state-owned enterprise uh, at a hotel, held at a hotel. So I attended many of these kind of uh, training workshops. So usually the, the XOE, would pay for all these uh, uh, events and they go to a nice resort and th they encourage uh, some of the employees, selected employees to participate in such activities. Now the third theme of the book is the emergence of a new kind of self that I call therapeutic self, a mode of self created with the aid of psychotherapeutic engagements. So either through private counseling or group training like this or self-help, right? But it's all through some form of psychotherapeutic interventions. So I ask in the book, why is the self granted such extraordinary salience among the middle class today? What specific projects of self-development and self-care are emerging in China? So the question of selfhood and self-cultivation has a long genealogy in Chinese history. I know many of you here are familiar with that. So in, in my book, I trace some important continuities and discontinuities from the dawn of the 20th century to Maoist socialism and to the post-Mao era. So this is a long, <laughs> big span of time and it's very complicated. I, don't have time to get into, but um, in my book, I, I try to uh, uh, kind of trace this development here. But let me just point out here that unlike the past, self-cultivation today has become a technical matter involving psychological experts intervention. And I think this is something relatively new to China. So when I talk about uh, therapeutic self, uh, theoretically, of course, I am very much influenced by uh, Michel Foucault's notion of technologies of the self, namely uh, referring to practices that seek to transform oneself through a number of operations on their bodies, thoughts, and the conduct. But I argue that such technologies are very much historically and culturally conditioned. So it's very different when we talk about France or England or Russia and China, we have to look at how uh, these kinds of technologies are very much historically and culturally shaped. Right? And I also borrowed Nicholas Rose's extensive study of what he calls the psychological complex in England but overall, I want to emphasize that the self here is not a pre-given, but rather it's a formed through constant social recognition and negotiation with one's social obligations and the cultural norms. And in China, the making of the self is further complicated by multiple coexisting expectations and ethics. So uh, I, just for the sake of being uh, clear here or sim uh, relatively simple. I name them as the traditional socialist and neoliberal sets of uh, expectations and ethics. So over the past two decades, 
This socially embedded selfhood has been undergoing profound transformations in China, but the, the search for self, zi wo, is still very much entangled with one's social obligations, ethics, and prevailing cultural norms. So I, uh, in the book, want to reveal this constant articulation of the self with the social, right? So it's not a simple move from um, socially embedded itself to a very individualistic self, but rather I try to outline how people uh, try to negotiate the tension between the self and the social and how very much people are still very much embedded in the broader social network. So um, in order to uh, illustrate uh, this uh, sense of uh, therapeutic self and how the therapeutic work on self is done. Let me just finally give you an example here uh, before I end the talk. Uh, this is an ethnographic example, a case I discussed in my book. So at a sand play, uh, briefly, uh, sand play theory, uh, sand play uh, therapy is like this. You have a sandbox and, and objects, and then you put together a arrangement and you have a dialogue with the therapist. So this is a training session I attended. So at one of these uh, sand play therapy training workshops, I met a Feng Gang, a distressed 35 year old city police officer who was going through a great deal of anxiety and confusion. So he sought psychotherapy training as a form of self-help to deal with his own social dilemma and emotional turmoil. So we later became very good friends because we uh, shared a very special moment uh, at the training workshop when I was assigned as his therapist in a simulated stand play session and he was my client. The arrangement he created was very telling. So this is the arrangement Feng Gang created after about 10 minutes. It was a desert scene with a red snake that happened, uh, that appeared to be stranded in the sand. So nearby, there was a cluster of uh, green cactus and a jade horn here. Jade horn usually symbolizes uh, good luck and hope. It took him a long time to put this together. And then he said softly, Quote, I feel that the snake is very lonely and stuck there. It's trying to move forward towards the green plants, perhaps the oasis in the desert, but it's very tired and will probably never get there. Unquote. So I asked carefully, does this thing speak to your situation? He nodded and tears came rolling down. He said, this no snake is just like me. I never had a chance to look at myself like this before. Um, I was somewhat shaken at first because I did not expect to encounter such an emotionally charged situation. I then learned that Feng Gang was a plain closed police officer responsible for catching pocket pickers on city buses. So his work was highly demanding and sometimes dangerous, but his supervisor did not trust him and accused him of slacking off. When Feng Gang became, uh, began to take his counseling classes in his spare time, he had to hide it from his supervisors and his family. At home front, it was also very difficult for him. He just had a newborn baby. And when he came home, he was exhausted, but he was expected to also help out with uh, uh, housework and his parents-in-law could not understand why a man like him, that's what they say, a policeman especially, would need to study psychology. Why would that be useful? So Fong looked very depressed to me, but he was uh, never seen by a psychiatrist or uh, never got a formal diagnosis, uh, partly because mental illness was still very much stigmatized in China and partly because he thought he could just toughen up like other men, but he was sleeping into deeper and deeper uh, sadness. This feeling of uh, bewilderment uh, was a main factor pulling him towards psychology training. He cherished 
the group training sessions that gave him a safe space to explore himself, his psyche and life, attending to his own anguish and opening up his feeling to others in a therapeutic setting like this was the first step towards healing. So I call in this book, this form of intimate yet social and therapeutic space, psychosociality, right? So this kind of workshop is, a, is both intimate and personal, but it's also social. So it's a psychosociality. Fong later offered me his reflection uh, on self-work. Quote, he said, the zuwo has two layers of meanings. One is uh, the self that's living here and now, which is deeply embedded in the family, kinship, and society. The other is the pristine wo, detached from the reality, which can only emerge from time to time when I'm alone. Uh, when I'm doing meditation or therapeutic work. He said, I'm longing for the disentangled self, but at the same time, I cannot abandon the socially embedded itself be because both together makes me human, unquote. So here, uh, disentangling refers to detaching oneself from the surrounding uh, through therapeutic work right, to create a space for self-reflection and healing. But then the next step is re-embedding into the social. It refers to the subsequent return to the social nexus after therapeutic work. So to me, uh, Fong Gang's statement here is very powerful because it highlights the complexity of the self as a relational dynamic one and constantly constituted through these different layers of sociality and personal desires. And just quickly here, he continued to study constantly and practice self-cultivation. So I met him two years later. I think his uh, situation was much improved and he was voluntary at the place to help school children with uh, emotional distress. So let me just offer a few concluding reflections here. Uh, throughout my research and the writing of this book, I have maintained a sense of ambival ambivalence towards the rising Psi fever in China. On the one hand, there is a tendency and a risk to psychologize a host of social economic problems that are derived from and demand social, uh, demand structural changes. So psychotherapy can be used as a political tool of neutralizing hegemonic ideas by turning all attention uh, to individual psyche away from structural problems. On the other hand, psychological intervention can also provide some relief and hope to those struggling with emotional torments and those who are longing to live a better life. So it's, it, it's a double-edged sword. I feel that it's important to treat this therapeutic turn seriously by discerning its promises and shortfalls, claims and unintended consequences. So finally, I want to say if anxiety can be seen as a general symptom of a society in distress, the aim of my book is to offer a glimpse of how individuals, families, organizations, and the government agencies in China grapple with this condition. So there are multiple forces here giving rise to the inner revolution beyond mental health concerns. It is also my hope that the stories I present in the book will not only convey anxiety, fears, and pain of the people who shared their life with me, uh, but also aspirations, hopes, and resilient spirits in their search for the good life in the midst of these massive societal transformations. So uh, thank you again for listening, and I look forward to the discussion. Hey. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk and very informative. 
Um, I'm, I, again, even after reading the book, I learned a lot about uh, the specific points that you were drawing out. Mm. So thank you very much. Um, we do have a, a question here. And the first question is uh, from Christopher um, Mason. And he says that uh, he, he studied, he learned actually from a study conducted in 2012 from a global health promotion that Chinese students were more depressed than Korean or Japanese students, um, particularly looking at, um, uh, I believe we're, we're talking about high school students. Mm. So would you know how China has started to confront this issue and what, it, what methods or ideas that have been used to help depressed Chinese students? Thank you. That's a, a very good question. And it's very true that Chinese youth today are under tremendous pressure and they have a lot of a, a mental uh, distress. Uh, I think at one point, yeah, it's probably the survey you refer to, but there are other surveys too in China um, showing that uh, a great percentage of Chinese students, both high school students and college students, have some form of mental distress, but also have a suicidal thoughts. And it's a very serious issue, right? Um, and the reasons are multiple. And now I, I think Chinese society today is just highly competitive, right? So there's a notion today in China, uh, it, got, it caught a lot of uh, media attention, it's called the Neijuanwenhua, involution. People feel like they are caught in this uh, hyper, competitive culture um, without exits. You cannot leave. You are caught in between. You have to compete. And, and that's how a lot of Chinese youth feel like today. And especially most of these kids today are singletons, right? The single child of the family planning policy. So these are the contexts. But your question, you know, how are there any policies or measures taken um, by the Chinese government. Yes, I think the government is aware of that. So uh, in, Chi in Chinese schools today, uh, for example, colleges, I believe high schools today, they are mandated to uh, have a psychological counseling office and have a counselor uh, to help with students. But I would say it's really understaffed right, because you, usually you have uh, over a thousand, several thousand students, and maybe you have only one counselor. So um, the help is getting there, but it's uh, uh, far from uh, adequate. And, and of course, you know, parents are also trying sometimes to bring their kids to private counseling by paying uh, a lot of money. But I think, uh, it's just the beginning of uh, raising awareness and there's so much that needs to be done. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I also recall seeing public service announcements about uh, your child is good, it's okay, just before the exam, that it's okay if they don't pass, it's okay that yeah. because the suicide rate was so high. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, yeah. The exams. And I remember the public service announcements uh, uh, trying to get at that. Yeah. Thank you for, for that question and fantastic answer. Um, right now we have another question from Glenn Adams. And so um, Glenn asks, what if sorry. any? Uh, um, uh, what happened? I'm sorry, I, I, okay, I got okay. my, I'm sorry. Okay, I got back, my sure. slides showed up, yeah. yeah. No, sure. Um, so a uh, question from Glenn Adams is, what if any differences do you observe between therapeutic and industrial slash organizational appropriations or articulations of psychological science. Um, that's e.g. positive psychology. Mm -hmm. um, that's the question. Your focus is on anxiety, but some of the examples you showed, corporate training, seem more like shaping of neoliberal self in non-clinical forms. What sort of influence, if any, do you observe indigenous slash endogenous Chinese forms of psychology have on the appropriation or imposition of hegemonic forms like positive psychology? 
Mm -hmm. Great question, and also so well articulated. <laughs> Very nicely articulated question. Well, one quick, one quick side note. Glenn is a fantastic colleague who studies psychology. In oh, I see. And I also in other countries, so he is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. it, it's very clear why that was a great question. Right. And well articulated. That's such a great question. I think you you really put your finger on the on the really point is that you know even though yes I'm talking about uh, uh, anxiety or depression, but oftentimes in those organizational trainings workshops, you are absolutely right. I think there the aim is not really to treat the depression or anxiety of those employees. It really is to uh, how to reshape, um, remold a different kind of person there. A different kind of person who is uh, resilient, reliable, who can be part of a productive workforce, right? So um, that's the goal. So there's a book I refer to in my book by uh, Elos, it's called Code Intimacy. And she talks about how uh, psychotherapy is used in a lot of uh, capitalist uh, organizations and productions. It's precisely how to shape uh, capitalism and shape a new kind of individual and organizational culture. So uh, psychotherapy and counseling plays a very important role there. So I think that is also what's going on in China. And I think in my book, I want to move away from just the clinical hospital setting into this kind of broad social domain to show the broad ramifications and the impact of psychotherapy um, on these kind of uh, uh, settings. But uh, your specific question about the Chinese forms, Chinese ways, um, there are a lot of, uh, uh, let me put it this way. So, um, so in those trainings, uh, the therapists try to incorporate a lot of uh, traditional uh, Chinese cultural practices or one can call the Eastern cultural practices. For example, uh, meditation, right? Into uh, Western psychotherapy when they try to use this in this big organizational settings. So, so they try to incorporate some of the also uh, traditional Chinese notions and the how to think about uh, families and the self and the relations into their training session so that uh, it's easier for uh, the Chinese to accept. Uh, for example, they don't use a lot of uh, classical uh, Freudian uh, psychotherapy, that type of thing. Uh, it's not very popular in China. Uh, on the other hand, positive psychology you mentioned is also extremely popular in China and partially it's sanctioned, it's approved by the government. Right? The Chinese government wants to approve only certain kinds of psycho psychology and psychotherapy in China and the, the government believes positive psychology is good because it's positive, it promotes positive outlook and, and aspects rather than bring up the negative forces in individual. So uh, Chinese psychotherapists also utilized a lot of positive psychology along with uh, the Satya family model, um, integrate all this together uh, as, as something they um, apply to the Chinese context. So there is a, a great deal of Bantu um, Hua, uh, indigenization there, um, but uh, there's also still, they still draw from a lot of the Western psychotherapy, yeah. Great, great question and a, a very good and clear answer. Um, I know we have another really good question up here, but I'm gonna, I'd like to expand a little bit on, on what Glenn's question was a little bit mm. uh, to talk about the idea of the reason why they started to use um, thought work and uh, uh, is that because it's already institutional and existing and that that was the best way the government would accept and allow this type of psychotherapy to be more broadly accepted if it was managed within a uh, process and a method that was already pre-existing instead of introducing a new method? Mm -hmm. Yes, well, because, yes, because most Chinese people, if you talk to Chinese people, especially those that say 30 years or older, 
they are all familiar with Sixiang Gongzuo. And even younger folks, although they understand Sixiang Gongzuo not as a political Sixiang Gongzuo, the younger folks, but even within a family, sometimes your mother or sister will come to say, go to do thought work of your brother to help me, right? So doing thought work is a familiar, long-standing method of changing one's ways of thinking and the outlook. So people are familiar with that. And I think Chinese psychotherapists kind of grasped on that and filled that with new content, right? So now uh, they know that people are sick of political uh, ideology, political studies. So now I take this form, but let me feel with how to improve your family relationship, how to improve uh, parent-child relationship, your marriage, and let me give you some new tools to help you change your ways of thinking. So a lot of Chinese clients find that extremely helpful because they can actually learn some tools to improve their own lives, even though the method might be a little bit old or familiar, but that's good. So it's not entirely alien to them. So. Might even be more effective than um, learning the three represents or uh, right. uh, yeah. other type of, of tools right. that they've been yeah. It was yeah. designed to, to indoctrinate. Um, right. Very good. So now we have a question, another, another really good question from, from Christopher Mason. And he asked, uh, did you notice any differences in attitudes regarding mental health in China between men and women? Or maybe even more broadly, was there a difference in generational groups? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question too. And it's a big yes. question, right? Um, absolutely. And especially generation difference. You will see a huge generation difference. The older generation, I would say people who are uh, 60 or older nowadays are a bit reluctant towards this new form of uh, intervention or help. They, they, they are very suspicious of, of, of that uh, because that involves opening oneself out, showing your dirty laundry of the family and everything. And, and there's a great deal, a great deal of uh, care about face, means. So the older people don't like to do that because you know, to be honest, for an effective psychotherapy, you need to be honest, you need to open up. And, and it's very, still very hard for a lot of older people to do that. But I think the younger generation, people who are younger, 20, 30 years old, even 40, they are more willing to open up. And it's a gradual process. In, in the book, I talked about various things that happened in China to lead us to this point. But even today, it's still very much stigmatized, right? So, but for the younger generation, they're a little bit more willing to open up. And then they can also utilize sometimes more anonymous ways of counseling. For example, online counseling, telephone counseling, WeChat counseling, that they don't have to show their face. Right? So it gives them a little bit of privacy. So generation difference is huge today. Uh, men and the women, uh, again, also, yes. You probably see the pictures in the magazines and the training centers. Most of them are women, younger women, professionals, some men, very few. So uh, all the places I have been to, I would say the rough estimation for people who go for uh, training and they get the license or just attend self-help workshops, I say 70% of them are women and 30% are men. And this has something to do with this kind of long-standing gender ideology, right? When men are supposed to do, women are supposed to do, women are still viewed as the caregiver of the family, especially emotional care. So if you have conflicts in the family, the mother is supposed to be the one who uh, bear most of the burden of uh, coordinating, um, dealing with that emotion. So if a, the, their child has issue, usually the mother would accompany the child to counseling. Um, fathers, it's very hard. Sometimes they do show up too, but it takes a lot of persuasion. And a lot of time the, the men just claim they're very busy. Um, and also they have a difficult time showing emotion. So that's why I really appreciate that case I gave you. Is, this is a police officer, <laughs> he's a man. And he was willing to open up. Uh, I think he was one of the two men at that workshop I attended. The rest of them are all women. Um, so it's rare, 
it's not common, but, but that's why I found it fascinating. Yeah. Great, thank you. So, so you would say um, fung gong was more of an anomaly, not really the, the, the norm. Right, yeah, definitely. But a great case. By the way, so I, I love uh, that case. I really <laughs> treasure that relationship, the friendship we built. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now we have a question from Christina. And she's saying that uh, as you talk about the urban psychotherapy mm -hmm. and that you noticed in the larger cities, um, she has two questions regarding this. First is Do you think that globalization had impacted the prevalence of these increasing number of cases in urban areas that were brought into urban communities? Mm -hmm. And the second question is, if you were to do your ethnographic fieldwork in rural areas, um, what do you, what other kind or different stressors do you think you would find? Would there be less stress or just different types of stressors? Mm, yeah, good question. Um, first of all, yeah, globalization, I think has a lot to do with what's going on. Uh, because as you see some of the slides I showed you, the international experts were brought into China, all the da shi, the big masters are all from North America, Europe. Germany, um, America, Canada. So those are the masters. And in the big cities, for example, a city uh, like Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou, I think psychotherapy is even more further developed because of the exposure uh, to all these you know, uh, global forces. Um, the, the second part of the question, okay, so first part of globalization and the second part, remind me, I lost the, the second part. Well, the second part was basically what kind of stress factors oh, yeah. would you uh -huh. find in rural areas or would there be less stress right, or just right. different types? Right. I say it's a different kind of stress, although we know very little about the rural area. Not many people have done research in the rural area. There is a book um, published some years ago by Wu Fei um, who studied suicide in the countryside. But that's a particular form of suicide. He argues in China, you find a lot of uh, uh, female suicide cases, but that's not for him. He argues it's not uh, instances of mental health, but it's more a moral protest. So a lot of time when people run into issues, I think John, you probably know better. So women, you know, especially daughter-in-law, would go to drink this uh, yao, the DDT or something as a as a moral protest. So it was written, the research was less about mental uh, health, mental illness. Not many people have done that. I mean, it would be extraordinary uh, to do that as well. I, I'm pretty sure in the countryside, the stress is there, but it's just a different kind of uh, stress. Yeah, one thing to quickly build on that is the, the, the suicide rate of women in, in rural China was some of the highest in the world by the 1990s, early 2000s. That has gone down dramatically since 2010, um, but what's gone up is uh, suicide of elderly folks. Mm -hmm. um, and but also that combination of protest and whatnot, but right. the illness is still yeah. um, understudied in that area. I would completely agree. Um, yeah. And that was also a, a really good question. Um, so, and so next is a question uh, by Kyung Wang, and he uh, says, is there a possibility that the states you know, that the, the, the leading psychotherapy can be a tool for regime resilience. For example, psychological techniques and police training in camps and for training police. So is this something that the state would agree upon or think is useful as a part of keeping the, the regime stable? Mm. Yeah, I uh, don't know what the top leaders are thinking inside their head, but I do know that uh, the Chinese military, so this is open, right? So open uh, information. If you, I'm surprised actually, <laughs> when I did some research, it's all out there on the internet. So the Chinese military, pretty top levels and the police issued a lot of mandates and regulations and called for the incorporation of uh, uh, psychology and psychotherapy methods into their uh, training of workforces. Uh, the goal is to create resilient and stable uh, combat forces and police forces because um, I think the leaders also realize, you know, you guys probably know in China when you have disasters like earthquakes and all those horrible disasters, oftentimes it is the military and paramilitary people who are called 
to those areas like Sichuan, Wenchuan, Dijian. And those are pretty traumatic scenes and experiences. Uh, and it, it's very hard for the soldiers, especially young soldiers to uh, deal with those. So I think the leaders are hoping that psychotherapy, this kind of positive training, especially positive training uh, created by Martin Seligman uh, in the US here, right? Um, they hope that it's gonna be very helpful for uh, training these soldiers into uh, some resilient, tougher uh, uh, people who can deal with this kind of trauma so that they won't end up with all this PTSD, right? post-traumatic disorder. Um, and that, that's certainly there to create a stable workforce, happier, I would say, stable, res resilient, and happier workforce. Sorry, my dog just walked in. It's very <laughs> important. Uh, whether it would ultimately help with the regime stabilization, uh, I, I can't say, I really don't know, but I think probably it, it provides uh, some stabilizing forces there. Yeah, probably some political scientists would know better. <laughs> I, I thought you explained that very well. As a matter of fact, in the book, it was really great how you say, you complete, you just write out, I completely expected to not see any of that in kind of state organizations, particularly yeah. military and police. But you, the data suggests that there was, and there was more than you expected. Um, yeah, that kind of, yeah. It was I was interesting to read surprised. that show. I was surprised by that. Yeah, I was like, oh, well, maybe I got to be careful how I can find those information, what I can write. And when I typed in, in Google, Baidu, it's there. Everything is there. It's like, oh, okay. It's uh, actually very open. <laughs> yeah, that type of open source um, yeah. information yeah. about that. And that's very much articulated and connected with this whole notion of uh, kindly power, guan ai, right? And that's promoted in the form of Hu Jintao up to now. I think the government wants to, you know, uh, cast itself in a different form, different light. Yeah. Actually, we have a question that's related to that. But before we get to that one, um, there's another question. Here. Your wonderful talk and book is, is, uh, is really generating a lot of really good questions. Right. Um, what right. role does religion play in promoting happiness mm -hmm. or even psychotherapy and, or just kind of uh, well-being? So what kind of role does religion play in promoting happiness in China? Right. Uh, religion is very, very important. So I didn't study Catholicism or uh, Christianity, the role of that in psychotherapy. But I know uh, actually a lot of uh, church organizations in urban China, they also train social workers, their own social workers um, uh, in psychotherapy, try to um, incorporate the psychotherapy with their religious uh, practices. Okay, so that's there. But another domain that I do know a lot is, uh, the incorporation of traditional Buddhism, tradition Buddhism, Buddhist, Buddhist practices, uh, Zen Buddhism into psychotherapy. And this is usually through the form of mindfulness and meditation. And uh, the funny thing is that this kind of uh, infusion of uh, Western, the so-called scientific psychological practices with uh, Eastern traditional spiritual practices actually comes from the West, comes from California. So I live in California. So we're in the, like a Mecca of such thing, right? So we have a lot of psychotherapists who are like ordained monk who practice meditation and mindfulness. And this is a big trend in the US. Some of the people you may have heard like Jack Cornfield, uh, John Kabat-Zinn, they are very popular actually. So uh, this kind of practice actually trickles back from California, from North America into China. And a lot of therapists are very much in, interested in using, I would not say religion in this case, maybe broadly defined spiritual practices, spirituality uh, into psychotherapy. And then they find this is actually much more effective and powerful than just relying on one or the other. 
So it's this kind of, so I have one, that one chapter in the book about uh, happiness, the pursuit of happiness actually talks about this trend, how to uh, blend these two approaches in the pursuit of happiness today in China. There, there was a, a, a survey on happiness in China about eight years ago, and mm. it showed that rural folks tend to be happier than urban folks, mm -hmm. but the least happy were rural to urban migrants. Mm. And so they, it was like this U shape. Wow. So yeah. 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 There's such thing as the happiness index. You, you may have heard of that. So uh, it's popular. They use that to measure whether people are happy, how happy they are in China. And they would rate Chinese cities as the happiness index, which city is the highest and the lowest. So people are kind of aware of that too. Yeah. Then we ask our friends in those Chinese cities, did you know you're in the happiest city? And they said, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah. Cynthia, Cynthia asks um, a kind of a similar, a little bit, you touched on this already a little bit, and this is uh, how have the effects of the, the spread of neoliberalism in China worked to allow the CCP to silence, alter, misdirect people's thought towards censorship and prevention of movement, um, and the idea of this loving and kind treatment of people? Mm -hmm. um, and so do you think these new forms of intervention, therapies, shaping of the self are intentionally based on a neoliberal framework? And basically the, another kind of short answer, uh, short question here is to what extent has a CCP um, exploited this, these uh, cultural uh, facets? Hmm. Very good question and uh, very complex. Um, I think, I, I would say that uh, I mentioned that certain therapies are encouraged in China, if not allowed, but encouraged in China and why others are not, right? And that's because the government wants to promote certain kinds of uh, citizens and attitudes, right? Um, I think psychotherapy in China, but not just in China, elsewhere in the world, um, has been criticized by a lot of people as a form of uh, uh, tools that can uh, deflect social conflicts, for example, and uh, deflect people's attention from, I mentioned, serious structural political issues to the individual inner workings. Right. So, so psychotherapy has long been criticized as such. And I think that's why I said that at the end of the talk, I'm very ambivalent towards that because I do see that at work, right? So now in those organizations, individuals say, okay, I know there are a lot of structural issues. I can't deal with them and I cannot change them. So what's next best thing to do to cope with this? Let me learn some basic tools and stuff to make myself happy because I can't change the structure anyway. So in a way, uh, you will kind of uh, uh, almost like a kill the potential revolutionary potential and direct people towards personal inner happiness. So there is a problem there. Um, but whether the CCP is consciously uh, utilizing this exploiting this, that's very hard to tell. I, I don't know, I don't know. But the, the effect is that it would help, it would serve certain purposes for sure. Mm -hmm. However, and as, as I said, it does also help some individuals who are struggling with various issues. So it's a, it's a very different, uh, it's very different situation to, to, to deal with. It's hard to just criticize psychotherapy right, um, that can be, you know, formed, like used as a, almost a form of false consciousness, basically. Um, it's hard to just criticize it because it does perform certain useful functions for individuals. But uh, yeah, I would not rule out that it also serves the purpose of the regime, yeah. Yeah, it's hard to measure intent. Um, at that, right. at, at that stage, but it's a great question and something that yeah. 
I would, would look at or, or something to delve That's into. That's the question. Um, uh, here's another question. Um, and this is outside of formal therapy. Did you notice anyone using different coping mechanisms in order to deal with mental stress or anxiety? Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Were there, yeah. you know, were there common traditional or maybe less traditional methods to de-stress or make themselves less anxious, right. even though they did go to therapy? Yeah. I say yes, absolutely. And most people actually do not go to therapy <laughs> because they cannot afford it. They don't have time, they don't have money. So most people find some ways of dealing with their uh, anguish, right? Uh, traditionally, you would have tried to find uh, friends and family members to talk about your issues. But nowadays, people are very busy. A lot of time, they don't have time, right? They don't have time for you now. So that's one way. And then people also uh, traditionally would engage in uh, traditional Chinese medicine uh, to, you know, take herbal medicines or use uh, acupuncture, acupressure. These are all, you know, like Nancy Chen uh, studied this sort of thing earlier in her Qigong book and playing Qigong and doing exercise, group dancing, um, uh, Tai Chi. So people engage in a variety of form of uh, uh, methods to deal with their, uh, their anguish. Yes. So, oh, oh, you know, uh, only a small group of people uh, go to therapy. But, but in China, when we say a small group of people, still millions of them. <laughs> yes. a, a small proportion is still a very large number. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, kind of uh, and along this similar lines is thinking about um, are there workers you know that that kind of go through this? Um, if so, you know what kind of ideal workers are promoted through psychological therapy in China? Do you notice any trend in trying to train workers into a certain type as they undergo stress um, and express their stresses? I guess this question is also kind of related. Do you see that traditional model? worker that has dealt with their stress because trying mm. to learn much about mm -hmm. making a model village right model right village. yeah that's such an interesting question yes it, i would say yeah now traditionally the ideal workers the models right uh, are those who not only work hard but are very loyal to the party right very loyal so your party loyalty political uh, correctness loyalty is a key part and then you work very hard right trickle then trickle Right. So today, I think the ideal workers are, are different. Uh, very few times they will mention loyalty, political loyalties. Sometimes they mention quickly, but it's more about creating happy workers, happy workers who don't complain. So one of the slides I showed you is called the Zhichang Xingfu, meaning workplace happiness. Is how do you create workers? who are happier, not complain, because there are a lot of complaints today due to the structural changes, the reform of SOE, and workers are put under a lot of uh, pressure to fulfill quotas, production quotas, and et cetera. So uh, nowadays, the ideal workers is, yeah, not only they work hard, but they don't complain, and they are happy. They have brighter, positive outlook of life. It's a form of attitude. Um, so that forms a very sharp contrast with the socialist time model workers, I would say. And of course, psychotherapy plays a very important role here in cultivating this kind of a new attitude. Attitude, resilient, uh, not complaining, happy, um, and that's very different from the past. Yeah, but that's that's an interesting question. I I say I have not thought about that contrast, but that would be very interesting to think about it. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can imagine um, like a traditional model workers where there would be uh, one local leader would promote somebody to be a model worker so that they can get promoted as they move. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and then in the past, you know, like a lay phone, right? The model, it's always like the notion also, not only loyalty to the party, but also selfless. You're selfless. You're working for others. You don't think about the self. Nowadays, it's not quite that way. It is okay to work on the self. It's not selfish, but it is 
quite okay to center and focus on yourself, how to improve yourself, your happiness, your family. So that's also, I think, a big shift. Yeah. So I, I have one, one quick question here, and that is, <laughs> we'll see how quick it is by the answer, is uh, it has to do with, um, actually, you touched on it in your book, and you talked about fungang, and the idea of Jungian, or Carl Jung's notion of wounded healers, and that he talked about this notion of people who need psychotherapy go into training and become psychotherapists because of their own uh, condition and their own uh, self that they want to work on. So is that an, an issue? Can you see that an issue in China? If so, is that something that um, would be a concern like Jung was, was talking about? Or is this something you think is just part of that development? Mm, interesting wounded healers. And I think, yes, I think not just China, it's definitely in China, but also here in the US. If you pay attention, you find out that you talk to, I, I, I speak to a lot of uh, psychotherapists, both in China and, and in the US, and I have several psychotherapists in the past. Uh, I, I was a client, a patient. So if you talk to them, you'll find out many of them are the so-called wounded healers. A lot of them started uh, to be, be interested in psychotherapy because they themselves had a lot of issues and uh, confusion, bewilderment, and that's how they started, just like Feng Gang, and they benefited from that tremendously, so they want to go out to ha uh, help other people. So in China, not everyone, of course, you know, psychotherapists, but uh, there, there, are, there are a lot of psychotherapists out there I talk to uh, fall into this category is they started with their own problems. And there's another case I counted in the book. Also, it's like this. She had a, a really uh, difficult traumatic uh, family experiences and emerged from that gradually from studying psychotherapy. So now she wants to help other people. So it's almost like a familiar story, a motif. Yeah, yeah. But here too, I think in the US, it's interesting. Yeah. I think he was mostly talking and referring to the U.S. or, or European. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, right. Well, great. Um, it seems like we've come right up to our time about now, and uh, uh, we've I've addressed all the questions. Um, and so we have an upcoming, uh, before we, we tune out, I'd like to say, first and foremost, I want to thank Professor John Lee for a wonderful talk. Um, a fantastic book, which I highly recommend, um, and a, a fantastic and very informative talk. Um, I also want, would like to remind the audience about our upcoming event on uh, Inequality in East Asia Symposium, which is on March 19th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Symposium will discuss the similarities and differences in the socioeconomic inequality between America and across three East Asian societies, China, Japan, and Korea. Um, so for more information, please contact us at ceas at ku.edu. Um, and again, um, Professor Zhang Li, um, you really have just uh, presented a, a remarkable talk. And uh, again, it's one of the Thank reasons you. why I enjoy being the director of, of the Century for Asian Studies, which is to do wonderful evenings like this. Yeah. So thank you, everybody. Thank and you. Uh, I thank you for attending. And great questions. Yeah, great. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and good night. So thank you. Um, hold on. We'll be in touch. Yeah. Let me see if I can. So are we on? Or are the we're people still on? on. I'm going to see if I can.